What do you do when you want to work on something in Minecraft without the risk of this happening to you? Maybe you want to work on an ocean monument without being bothered by any guardians. Maybe work on a hero of the village farm at a pillager outpost, but don't want to be bothered by all the idiots that are going to spawn and just shoot at you left and right. Maybe you're just sick of drop creepers falling on your head when you're caving. Or you want to clear out a fortress for a whiskey farm or dig out an area for a gold farm and you just don't want to die every two minutes. Well, it's not peaceful mode. It's a mob switch. Let's get to it. All right, ladies and gentlemen, Strom back with another three levels video. And this time we're going to do three levels of mob switch, but uh, they don't really fit the normal level. So essentially it's just going to be three types of mob switch, right? Before we get into it, though, as always, there will be a world download down in the video description where you can download this world. Check out the builds for yourself. You'll be spawned in on this platform behind me where you can teleport to the different builds. Check out what's going on. Grab schematics, you know, mess with it yourself, test it, all that good stuff. Now, before we get into everything, there's going to be a few things we have to explain here of what's going on. If you feel like you already know what a mob switch is and just want to see the types of mob switches, look down in the video description. There will be timestamps where you can skip ahead to those different levels because we've got quite a bit to cover here. This is everything we're going to cover in the intro. So we're going to talk about what a mob switch is. We're going to talk about the Minecraft mob cap. We're going to talk about persistent mobs and how you get them. Uh, the mob cap as it pertains to persistent mobs, what chunk loaders are, and then your spawn chunks. So what is a mob switch? In Minecraft, a mob switch is some kind of system that you can turn on and off that will control whether or not hostile mobs can spawn in the dimension that you build the switch in. So if I want to do some work in the overworld and I don't want things to be able to spawn, you know, things like creepers, zombie skeletons, and all that, I can build a mob switch for the overworld. Same thing goes for if you're in the nether uh, and a little bit more difficultly in the end, but you can still do that. The whole concept behind a mob switch is that you load up enough mobs that you can no longer spawn any more mobs inside of your world. Now, if it's single player, that's a little bit less than on a server, but we'll get to that in just a moment here. But basically you're loading up enough mobs and you're keeping them loaded. So that when the game goes to try and spawn a mob in each tick, it says, you know what? I already have too many mobs in the world. We need to, we need to stop we need to abort, abort, abort. And then all you need to do is unload those mobs and your world is back to normal spawn generation. That brings us to topic number two, the mob cap. You heard me mention that. If you don't know what that is, what is the mob cap? So I have the carpet mod installed on my client here. And what we're looking at on the top of the screen, I've subscribed to the mob cap so we can see what the current mob cap is. But basically each person inside of a world, so a single player that's one, in a server, they can overlap, but basically each person can allow up to 70 mobs per person. And that's any hostile mobs. So those hostile mobs go towards that mob cap. So if there are 70 creepers in the world, you can't spawn anymore. You will notice a couple of times it's actually popping up a little above that at 71, sometimes up to 72, that type of thing. That's because a pack spawns, a pack spawn can still do it. But basically you can always assume that the maximum amount of mobs you can have is 74 inside your 70 mob cap. Once that number is up there, it's not going to spawn any mobs. The reason you see it changing is because mobs that are you know far enough away from the player, these guys are too close, but mobs that are far away from the player can despawn, and then they open up the mob cap for new ones. So I'm going to run a command just to kill skeletons real quick, then open the mob caps. What we can see is that mob cap actually drops real low, so you saw 50 of 70 up there on the left side. That means there were 50 mobs out of the available 70, but then it spawned those up right quick. So real quick, I got those spawned in. What we want to do is we want to load up 70 mobs in a controlled environment. It can be anywhere in the overworld as long as we keep it loaded, and we'll go over that in a bit. But basically, that's what the mob cap is. It restricts the number of mobs that can spawn in your world so you don't just have hundreds of mobs running around trying to kill players. Now, what are persistent mobs? We talked about how those mobs underground can despawn when they get far enough away from the player. They have a random chance to despawn when they're outside of 32 blocks from the player, but 128 blocks away from the player, they will definitely despawn. So how do you keep them loaded if you're gonna go more than 128 blocks away from them or even more than 32 blocks? 
Well, there are certain activities you can do in order to keep mobs from despawning. That turns them into persistent. Now, in this case, we have a creeper in a boat. One common way is to put them inside a boat or a minecart. That keeps them from despawning, which means they have become persistent. So even if I leave this area, go more than 120 blocks away, this guy is not going to despawn while he's in the boat. Once he's removed from the boat, he is no longer persistent. It's just the boat that's keeping him persistent. So that's all persistent is, is it means he won't despawn. However, adding him to the boat in this case does not help us with our mob switch because this actually removes him from the mob cap. So, you know, even though he's not going to despawn now, if our mob cap was at 70, this creeper was at one of them, I put him in the boat. My mob count is now at 69. It's open to spawn another one and it will spawn another mob somewhere else. So even if we have 70 creepers in boats, that just means we're going to have 70 creepers in boats and still an available 70 mob cap. So how do we get around this? Well, first we need to take into account all the ways that we can make a mob persistent and then see what we can do about it. So first of all, there are mobs out there that will attack you that aren't necessarily considered monsters like this polar bear here. However, he does not count towards the mob cap because it is a passive mob. So we can eliminate him from the equation. Next up, minecarts, just like we talked about before, mob inside of a minecart, it's only persistent. Well, it's in the minecart, if we eject it, it's no longer persistent, and inside the minecart doesn't count towards the mob cap. And that applies to the boat, like we talked about. You may have seen those videos that uh, tell you to use your iron farm early game with a zombie that picks up an item, because a mob that picks up an item and holds it in his hand is now persistent. However, even though it won't despawn, not part of the mob cap. So what about hitting him with a name tag? Because Putting a name tag on a mob means they won't despawn. They become persistent, right? Still not part of the mob cap. What if we send a mob to another dimension? We send the mobs through the nether and then they go in the nether so that we're not flying 120 blocks away from there anymore because now it's unloaded. Well, now not only are they not loaded, but they don't count to this dimension's mob cap. So a mob will only count to the mob cap in the dimension that it's currently residing in. So this doesn't work. And we appear not to be left with much. But over here, we have some options. These are four of the mobs that at least I know of, and as far as I'm aware, the only known mobs that we can use for mob switches because they stay persistent, but they count towards the mob cap. We have withers. So when you summon a wither, it counts towards the mob cap, but it's not going to despawn on its own, no matter where you go. Wardens, as long as they are spawned inside the world, count towards the mob cap. There is no warden mob cap itself, so wardens can be spawned even while over the mob cap, but they will restrict other things from spawning if you have them loaded. Shulkers, so shulkers loaded up in whether they're in the overworld, the nether, or the end, whatever, they will count towards the mob cap. So if we have 70 shulkers, that's going to knock out the mob cap that's available. And last but not least, zombie villagers. So zombie villagers normally are not persistent. But if I have a villager that has a profession and I make just one trade with him, so just enough to get him on that XP bar, once he gets converted over to a zombie, he is now going to be a viable persistent mob because he will count towards the mob cap, but the game is designed to not let him despawn because you don't want to lose his trade deals. So any of these four types of mobs, if you have a single player world, if you keep 70 of them loaded, or let's say you have a server with friends and there's there's four of you that will play on there. So you want to do 280 just so that no matter where you are, you won't get any mobs spawning. These four types of mobs will count towards the mob cap unless you do one of these things to them that we discussed earlier. So like if I name tag this zombie, uh, if I put this shulker in a minecart then uh, yeah, they're not going to count. If the, you know, if the warden is another dimension, he's not going to stop mobs in this one. But we're going to go through systems that will use these types of mobs. So that was two birds with one stone. We covered what persistent mobs are and then how they apply to the mob cap and their persistent mobs. Now I did say you have to keep them loaded. So you have two options here. You have a chunk loader or you have your spawn chunks. Now, Normally when we talk mob switch, the nice thing is being able to have a switch that you turn on and off. So you can enable the mob switch to stop all mob spawning, or you can disable the mob switch to let mobs spawn normally. Let's say you want to run one of your farms or something like that, like your general mob farm, uh, something like that. In this world download here, I have two kind of chunk grids laid out. So if you come into this world, press F3 and G on your keyboard at the same time, you're going to get your chunk borders. And if you don't know what loaded chunks are, let's take a moment to talk about that right now. Once any entity, so a player, a mob, a boat, 
Um, even an item, I can throw that item through. Once that goes through another portal, what Minecraft does is it loads up a certain amount of chunks around the nether portal on the other side so that it can make sure that there's nothing that's supposed to happen inside those chunks. But the nice thing is it keeps that area loaded for 15 seconds. So if I was to take this wood and throw it through, now the area inside the nether is going to be loaded for 15 seconds. If I throw another one through, that's going to reset. So if I just keep throwing items through and going through there, that 15 second timer is never going to run down. So we can keep that area loaded if what we do is just keep sending items through the portals. Now that also means we need to have items that come back through. So we're gonna get into some chunk loaders. There are a lot of chunk loaders out on uh, the YouTubes, on the internet, on the forums. The one we're gonna use in this video is the one by Dark. It's, uh, I believe he referred to it as this V2. I'll put a link for that down in the video description. It is not my chunk loader. So I'm not gonna to talk too much about the details and how to build that. Go check out that video for how to build that one. Otherwise you can use your favorite chunk loader. These all work off of the same principle. All of them are the idea of sending some kind of entity or item back and forth through the portal to the nether, back to the overworld, to the nether, back to the overworld under that 15 second cooldown and then just permanently keeping the chunks around it loaded. Now, luckily for us, that area is not the same as your render distance. So you can see, I can see all that distance. I'm only on render distance 12, but you can see I have these kind of lines out here and I'll turn off the chunk borders for a second. The orange, the lime, and then this glass line. What the heck do those represent? Because those are way smaller than the loaded area. We're going to talk about two areas around a chunk loader. There are actually some more extended areas that we, we don't really need to get into because it's not applicable to us. But basically, if I turn chunks back on here, we can see that there is the center chunk that the uh, nether portal is located in, as well as three chunks around it. So basically, in this three by three for a total of nine chunks that process just like a normal part of the game as if a player was there, but just inside these nine chunks. So zombies will walk around, villagers will get scared, golems will attack things, lava will flow, water will flow, all that type of thing will happen inside of these lime green concrete chunks. So that's that uh, three by three centered on the chunk that has the portal. Does not matter if the portal is all the way over here on the edge of the chunk, wherever it is inside of, that's where it's actually going to start. So right in here in this chunk, and then go around the three chunk lines. Next chunk over, you can see I have outlined in this orange concrete. I was gonna say kind of orangish color, but it's literally orange concrete. This area of the chunks will not process entities. So things like mobs, things like items, uh, mine carts, that type of things will not get processed. They will not run any AI. They will not try to do things. However, the game will keep them loaded. So it'll be like as if we have this active shulker right here that's popping its head open. And then this one out here in the orange rings while that chunk loader is running is just going to sit there and do nothing. So it significantly reduces the amount of work that it has to do, thereby significantly reducing the amount of lag that it could possibly create. Now, all of our chunk loaders, what we're going to do is we're going to have our mob switch inside this outer ring right here. So again, that is with the uh, nether portal centered on there. So we take that chunk, we come out one chunk and another chunk. And that way we can just have these loaded up so that they're still counted, but the game's not trying to process what they're going to do. And the lag on here is going to be negligible for these designs. If you scale these up for a server, you know, you start getting up to 500, 1,000, 1,500. You might need to do some advanced planning for that. Maybe not build them as close to spawn as I'm going to, so you don't run into them, that type of thing. But when they are on these exterior chunks here, this next chunk layer out, they are going to create so little lag, it's almost as if they weren't there. So that's the idea of chunk loaders. Now, the other thing is, as long as you have a player in the overworld or you have some chunks force loaded in the overworld somewhere else, your spawn chunks, the large area around where you spawned in actually stays permanently loaded. So any mobs that you have of that type that we talked about earlier, the uh, shulker, the warden, the wither, or the zombified villager that's been converted after being traded, those inside the spawn chunks would count towards the mob cap. So if you didn't want to run chunk loader, you can actually use the edge of the spawn chunks. And we have the same thing with spawn chunks. You can see right here, we have this lime green area. So everything in here is entity processed. Out here is not. 
So we have these two chunks in between there. I come out here and then anything that would be on this side of the line would still count towards the mob cap, but it wouldn't get entity processed. Again, if I'm not in this area, but then once I move it over to this side of the line here, then it's actually no longer going to apply to that. It'll no longer be that permanent loaded state. So the idea of this, and you could see this in, uh, uh, for example, Il Mango recently did a warden mob switch on a skyblock world where he had them go up in a bubble column, they crossed over the line, and then they kind of fell down into their cell. And that's how he permaloaded it, because at that point he didn't have access to the nether yet to do a chunk loader. Now, I laid these out in this world using the mini HUD option to show the uh, overlay for where the spawn chunks are. If you do not have that option or you're on a server that has that kind of thing blocked that you don't have access to that, there is another way to find exactly where those spawn chunks are going to be. If you take a compass, it is always going to point to what the game has set as the world spawn, and that is one column. So the world spawn is always going to be on one single block. However, there's an area around it of these uh, two by two chunks that if you die, you can spawn at. So you die, you spawn there, and then the next time you spawn there, and the next time you spawn there, and the next time you spawn there. But whichever chunk you spawn in determines where those are going to be laid out. And you can see in this case, it's actually right on the corner of there. So all you need to do is take a compass and just kind of walk around until you see, okay, now it, oh, it immediately flipped. And if I go here, then it's pointing over here. You can use that compass to find exactly which block it is and then you know which chunk to count out from. So including the chunk that you are standing in for where the spawn block is, you can count out 10 in each direction. So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. 10. Boom, there's one edge. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, 10, and another one. Same thing this way, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, 10, and there we go. And then that way, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. 10. That's the edge of your entity processing spawn chunks. Then you just count over another two and that is your kind of lazy spawn chunks. And that is your non-entity processing chunks. So we just talked about a lot of stuff. At this point, I have no idea how long the video is gonna be at this point. Hopefully it'll be under 17 hours. But with all that out of the way and explained, I'm gonna show you now three systems that you can use, one for each type of mob. It's up to you if you wanna try and come up with something that's gonna use the spawn chunks, but again, for all of these ones, we're going to use the chunk loaders because then you have a nice on-off option and you don't have to worry about moving mobs around. It makes it much simpler. So again, the ones we're gonna be covering are zombie villagers, wardens, and shulkers. Um, don't press that button. Don't, don't press the wither button. Don't do it. Just don't. Don't do it. So without further ado, let's get into it. Let's start out with zombie villagers. So this is an example of a setup using the zombie villagers that you can use with a station to create them. So what we have here is, you may have seen this before, this is the villager breeder from the Hero of the Village farm. You can add on more modules if you wanna uh, get villagers even faster or just do a quick dirty build if you wanna just grind it out. We have here the baby villager sorter by method. So this sorts out the babies when they turn into adults and drops them in here. What we have is we have a station to pick up a villager, give it a profession so that we can do a trade. And the reason I like using masons, I'm just gonna hit this button to extract a villager, is this villager will then take a job from that mason stand. We can always buy bricks for one emerald. So you just need, you know, if you're doing 70 mobs, you only need 70 emeralds to get it going. Um, you're gonna probably need a couple more and we'll get to that in a moment. But then the nice thing is when you send this off and this piston pushes it, it breaks this workstation because you can push a stone cutter. So now it's ready for the next one. But then we send him off. It then sends him over to the zombie to get zombified. Now in this case, this guy is not persistent. He's in a minecart, but as soon as he's ejected from the minecart, he's not persistent. That's because we didn't actually trade with him. So before we send him off, we need to do one trade with him. Just one. All we need is just that little bit on there. And then we can send him off to get zombified. Now this guy, once he gets ejected from the minecart, is still not going to despawn. But the reason I've built this with glass here is you do need to check his hands. If he spawns in with an item in his hand, or, you know, if you, like, drop an emerald and he picks up one. Let's see if this guy will pick up something. No, it doesn't look like it. But if he picks up something, he will no longer count towards the mob cap. So if you do this 70 times, but five of your guys have picked up items or holding items in their hand, you'll then only have a mob cap filled of 65. And once we do that, so I'll trade with this guy, so he's going to be persistent. Send him off. He'll get ejected into this cell. We do have a twisted vine, or excuse me, not a twisted vine, a ladder in this setup. 
so that they don't entity cram. So that's how we can have over 70 in this cell right here. And then you just keep repeating this process until you have 70 in there. We do have this little counter here. So every time you send it off, it just drops an item into this chest. So in this case, uh, after I've reset it, I've done 14 and that can help you keep count. Once this is filled up with at least 70 zombie villagers that you have done one trade with that are not holding items. So you see a couple of these guys have swords. They don't count. So each time you do that, you can either just, you know, kill the guy and not have him go into the chamber or, you know, put him in the chamber and just remember that he doesn't count towards it. But now we have our mob switch right here, but we need a way to keep it loaded. So remember we we're talking before about the chunk loaders. We want to keep that in a certain area. So I'll turn on chunk borders here. We can see this is the chunk that the zombie villagers are in. We've gone over one chunk and then one more chunk. And that's where we put in the chunk loader. So this is still that same chunk loader, that dark chunk loader that once again, look down the video description if you want to learn how to build this. And we put that outside of that chunk. So now once this is loaded, once I come here and turn this on, this area is now chunk loaded. It will then chunk load these guys. So we can see right now I have 74 out of 70 mobs. And even if I fly really far away, so I'm out here in the middle of nowhere and I still have 72 mobs loaded up. So now I'm at 72 of 70, meaning that if I look underground, there's going to be no mobs spawning anywhere because my mob cap is already full up. This is also going to get quite loud. So maybe turn down your sounds for it. Um, I have the sound muffler mod, so I can just muffle sounds individually. That's why they're so quiet right now. And then as long as you don't do anything to these guys right here, they're just going to stay in that spot. Again, not entity cramming because of the ladder, because they think they're climbing then. So then they don't actually collide. And we can see even standing here with the extra villagers that I have, I'm only at 10 MSPT. And if I flew away again, even with that area chunk loaded with those mobs, I'm still only there. I'm at 11 MSPT. It's settling down. Actually, no. Now I'm even lower. Now I'm at 9 MSPT because all those chunks have been loaded. We just have them lazy loaded now. But again, you still see that I have 72 out of 70 mobs and no mobs below ground. But like I said, remember, one of the key factors is making sure that these guys don't have something in their hands. So there's actually probably about 80 in here because I opted to just still send them over to the cell and do whatever. Like I said, you could kill them before they get over here, but you just want to make sure that when they're inside that cell. So, you know, don't drop items like right here and have them be able to pick it up. Yep, because we just had one pick it up and now we can see I'm down to 71 out of 70. So if you start dropping items around here, that's going to be a problem. Now you can get to the point where you can, once you're done, you can seal this up, maybe put even more of a barrier around it, you know, like this so that items can't get to them for them to be able to pick up. But you know, that's just kind of an extra step. You just kind of make sure. So I totally did that on purpose for two reasons. One, to show you why you want to make sure you keep a solid block above the zombie villagers. And two, um, totally wanted to, you know, prepare to have a, you know, nice clean build for you to take a schematic off of in the world download. Yep. 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 Totally legit. Totally legit. Yep. 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 Only final note I have here. We do have this one high water kind of flowing to the back and to the side. To just keep the zombie from getting too close to the minecart so that if you do accidentally send a minecart when it's empty like this, that we don't pick up that uh, zombie that you have saved for the zombification. But all the other minecarts, they do get recycled back here. They get sent back to this. And when you get to this point where you're out of villagers, you just got to wait for more. Normally, if you're running this, you'd have babies on deck waiting to get in there. That type of thing. But if you don't want to wait for it, by all means, you can build on more villager breeders. Just you want to make sure that you have a bed for each villager and then an extra bed for each. So essentially two beds per villager. You know, math, math is apparently hard for me to say two instead of one plus one, but that way they can have extra babies each day and then they're gonna provide themselves with carrots. Um, I'm actually gonna... One thing, if you saw earlier screenshots of this throughout the video, you would wanna make sure that you actually spread out these workstations because they will only gather carrots a certain distance away from their workstation. So we're just gonna put some around the edges on each side. That way they can harvest all the carrots instead of just some.
And that's pretty much it for this one. Again, remember the main thing is you want to keep that loaded in those lazy chunks because if you're doing this on a server where you want to put, let's say like 300 of them in there to cover a few players, then if you have this loaded in this chunk right here, for example, this is going to cause a lot more lag because now these entities are all going to try and walk around. They're all going to check their collisions, all that. Whereas if you just do it in this outer ring, like we showed before, then all it's going to do is just check that they exist and that's all. So it'll keep your lag significantly reduced. You're talking maybe one or two MSPT for the mob switch instead of a billion MSPT. Next up on the list, we're going to do the wardens. This is, in my opinion, the quickest and easiest one to build as long as you feel comfortable around wardens. If you don't feel comfortable around wardens, then by all means, this is the most terrifying. But let's take a look at this one. Okay, this is so loud. I'm going to turn those way down there. But basically what we have here is, once again, we have 70 wardens all stacked up in here, or however many wardens you want. And we're keeping them persistent with this note block clock. So this note block is, just keeps going off. You can see they're all staring at that note block. They want a piece of that. And so that keeps them distracted and keeps them from despawning. So we can keep them that way. Once again, we have the chunk loader. So here we go. We have this is the chunk that the wardens are in. We go over a chunk and then one more chunk. Now, this um, chunk loader can be anywhere inside that chunk. So you can see here we have it right up next to the edge. That's fine. It just needs to be outside of that chunk border that's right there. And this little system is what's going to get them spawned in and get them trapped for us. So if you didn't know, if you have a shrieker that does not have a skulk sensor around it, then making noise around it won't do anything. So if I just break the slab here, that shrieker is doing nothing. You actually need a player to touch this in order to activate it. So once you come in, you get your uh, skulk sensors cleared out of the area, then you'll be good to go. As far as spawning the warden, they can only spawn in an 11 by 13 by 11 area around the shrieker. So vertically, sorry, horizontally, that's five blocks in each direction. So we can see here, this is centered. So that's six and then one, two, three, four, five, one, two, three, four, five. And then we have that for a total of 11 in that direction, that direction, and then 13 centered on the skulk sensor this way, or excuse me, shrieker going up and down. So if you have this set up here and you've done it at floor level, but there's actually like some area underneath that has spawnable blocks, then yeah, you can get a warden down here. It can sniff you out and kill you. But with this setup here, this is nice and clean. So these are top half slabs right here. So if I was to assemble this, we can see that's one block there. So he can spawn on these. Then what we have is we have another little note block on a clock here that that's going off. So the warden won't get distracted by the player standing underneath. He'll spawn, let's say like right here and then run over into this water stream. We do have the water stream flowing uh, backwards a little bit so that if the warden just kind of touches the water, you know, and then get stuck, he'll get pulled in and up. Then we have a scaffolding here. That scaffolding, we can see we have a twisted vine in there so that we stop any entity cramming. They float up through. A couple of them will just kind of bounce underneath, but most of them are going to pop up all the way up through the scaffolding. And then that's really it. Now, I did include an on-off system if you want to not use your mob switch for a while and decide, you know what, I just let's go ahead and get rid of the wardens, maybe so you can do some work in the area. I did include a water bucket here to drown them. So if I turn this off down here, it's going to turn off both note block clocks. <sighs> and then it's going to spit water into this top block by their heads. So we just have a, uh, you can't really see it right now, but we have a fence gate there that's open just so that they don't go through there. This is going to take a while for them to drown. However, this is better. Than Joe, gosh. Let's suppress that sound too. Thank God for this mod. Um, you can see they're they're gonna start dying, but they're gonna start dying really slow. So if I go in there, you can look at my um, top left there. You can see Entity Warden HP. Yeah, it's gonna take a while for them to go down, but this will safely kill them to where you don't have to open up the chamber or try and get rid of the Twisted Vine and drop blocks in them or any of that. It'll just, uh, eventually they'll drown. And there we go, they all drown. So now it's ready to be turned back on. When I turn that back on, it's gonna suck the water back. turn on the clocks and we're ready to go. So now to fill this up, all we need to do is come stand on top of this shrieker. And I do have another counter here so that we can keep track of where we are. So we just put uh, however many you know sticks or whatever item in this dropper. It doesn't matter. This is just a counter and then stand on the shrieker. 
Now all we have to do is AFK until we get 70 Wardens, and once again we can count that by how many items are in the barrel. We're going to see that a Warden is going to spawn up. If you're worried about the Warden spawning and getting distracted on you, as long as you have built up your spawning area just right, you don't have to worry about that. So this is actually the mob switch that I built up in Hardcore. Um, I'm doing my Hardcore world on Twitch, so I've picked up Twitch again. And there we go. So here comes our Warden. Coming out of the ground on these spawnable slabs here. He's going to get attracted to this note block clock. There we go. He tries to walk through. He thinks that he can walk through these trap doors. He gets sucked in and moves his way up. Now he's nice and in place and in the chamber and persistent. We've already got our next one coming. Whereas I accidentally deleted a block there when I was working on it. So now our note block clock is actually going. So let me go ahead and summon a bot here. So we can see what we're doing a little bit better. Now he's properly getting attracted in there right away. So he goes right in there. He doesn't have enough time to sniff out the player at all. Because he's so distracted by this note block. And like I said, we just keep doing that until we have 70 wardens. Once again, you can see they're climbing on that. So they're not going to entity cram. So we can have as many wardens in there as we want. So again, you want to do this on the server and have 500 of them in there. All you got to do is just sit there and wait. So you have 500 wardens up in that slot. And again, you can use this as your counter to see, okay, we have five in there now. We just got to wait. So again, super cheap on this one, but really your only concern here is making sure that you get this spawn proofing right. So even if you have like a, a block that they can collide with, you got to make sure it's not spawnable. So something like the bottom half slabs, except for this one area. And again, 11 by 11 by 13. So count out five horizontally in all directions and six vertically up and down. So six up, six down. Make sure that area is clear of spawning spaces, except for this spawning platform right here. And then boom, super easy. Final one is shulkers. Now this is one that is actually, in my opinion, kind of one of the safest and one of the most useful. Because once you get a shulker farm up, you can just recycle your shulker farm to do this for you. So it has a dual purpose. You know, these you're building up just to do those functions. This, at the end of it, you have a shulker farm. And now you just get free shulker shells. So all we have here is we have a cell where we sent shulkers from the nether back here. And I'll show the shulker farm in a minute. You can use your favorite shulker farm however you want to do that. Obviously, preferable would be to use one that uses the overworld. So not the single dim ones in the end, because then you got to send every single one. But that's really up to you how you want to transport them. And again, for this, same principle would work in the nether. If you have this kind of cage where they're inside of there, you just still want to make sure you don't go near this cage where they can see you. You know, so maybe surround it with some more unspawnable blocks that they can't see you through. Otherwise, they're all going to aggro, start killing each other, and it's you're going to have a bad time. But once again, we have the chunk that the shulkers are in. So we can see right there the chunk borders where it ends. You can fill up an entire chunk. You can do extra layers of this. So a shulker can teleport after it comes out through the portal in a distance of a 17 by 17 by 17 cuboid. So 17 blocks, but centered on that shulker. So basically uh, eight blocks out in any direction from there. So you can build this larger to accommodate for that. And then this is the chunk we're in. We come over one chunk and then add a chunk. And that's where the chunk loader is. Now, in this case, you do want to push the portal further away so that you can make sure that you don't accidentally link that portal and that portal. That would be rough. But as far as which shulker farm you use, so if you come here and you fly to the east just from this location, this is my shulker farm, uh, my V2 of the shulker farm. I don't recommend building this. There are other ones out there that will automatically refill this one. So problem with my design here is if that shulker inside of that shulker farm gets lost, you actually have to press a button here on the overworld to restock it. So we do have backup shulkers, but you have to come press this button to send a mine cart and send the new one in. I really want to rework this um, because in that hardcore world I mentioned, I'm saying that if I have a farm for it, I have to use my farm design. Can't use someone else's farm design. And um, this I'm not happy with. So I am planning to rework this. But for now, um, El Mango Shulker Farm, there's a whole bunch of overworld shulker farms um, that are going to do it for you. But whatever shulker farm you're using, when you send them to the nether where you normally pick up your backup shulkers, all you need to do is just redirect the rails so that instead of going to the killing chamber or going to the overworld, they then go over to your next portal. So we have right over here, this was our chunk loader portal. This is the portal we can go through, so that's why I've done it in Lime. This is the portal that leads into the chamber where the shulkers are going to pop out. 
right here. I press the button to grab the minecart. It's going to grab the shulker. Come over here, it's going to pass our chunk load portal and then eject into this portal. And it's going to send them back into this cell right here where we can then build them up and just let them chill. So probably the trickiest part of this one is, I mean, of course, first of all, you have to set up a shulker farm, but again, shulker farm is great. I definitely recommend getting a shulker farm on your single player, on your server, whatever you want to do, because then you just have shulker boxes of plenty. So this is the biggest build overall, the biggest effort, because you got to bring shulkers back from the end and get it all set up with a farm. But at the end of it, it serves two purposes. So this is usually a go-to for servers. Um, one, because shulkers don't have the same kind of pathfinding. So even when you do load the area, they're not as much of an issue. They're not colliding with each other. So once again, much less calculations on the MSPT. But then, like I said, at the end of it, you have a shulker farm and it's easy to just, you know, put some minecarts going back and forth. If you want to send this further away or you want to do this in the nether, maybe you just have your uh, rails going through a chamber that you have set up here in the nether and they eject inside that chamber and that's where they stay so that you can have another mob switch doing maybe your gold farm or something like that. That's also an option. But just make sure that before you start this whole process, you've got those portals lined up and you don't have like shulkers coming out of your your uh, chunk loader portal or something like that. And then all we got to do to turn it on is go back to the overworld, flip our switch. And then once again, we have all our mobs loaded. So in this case, I put 75 in there. So I'll go ahead and fly away. And we can see I don't have any mobs spawning underground because I have those shulkers chunk loaded. So again, if you want to use this, this design works. It's just that sometimes in rare cases, sometimes it's after an hour, sometimes it's after 12 hours of AFKing this farm, that shulker will teleport out without duplicating, and then it will need to get replaced, in which case you as the player have to press this button in order to reload it. But I will also link down to it down in the video description if you want to see how the shulker farm mechanics work, and also link to a video on how to get a shulker to the overworld as well. There are several uh, versions. I like this one because it's nice and repeatable. A couple of final notes. As we mentioned, you can technically do a mob switch with withers. Just don't press this button, though. I think the wither mob switches are outdated with um, the options that we had added with shulkers, with wardens. Um, I still think that the zombie villager option is a very viable option for a mob switch, especially on a low count uh, player world or a single player world. So don't press the button. Just, just, just don't because withers, they're, yeah, they're a huge pain. And again, down in the video description, there will be a world download where you can download this world for yourself. Um, grab schematics, look through this, kind of mess around with them, um, give them a test to make sure that you feel comfortable with them. If you want to know how I'm viewing these mob caps, this is with the carpet mod, the command to enable that. If you have the carpet mod is log mob caps. And then you too can see what your mob caps are without having to do those counts. Because like we said, the shulkers and the wardens, they will remain persistent as they're in the world because they're always persistent. They always count towards the mob cap. But if you leave them inside of a boat or a minecart, or if you have a zombie villager that picks up items during its process, that no longer counts to the mob cap. So I do see that question come up a lot of, hey, I built this zombie villager mob cap and there's still mobs spawning everywhere down in the caves. It's maybe a little less. And then they show a picture of it and like half of them are holding items in their hand. So it's barely noticeable that you even have a mob switch. So that's going to wrap it up for this three levels video. Definitely, like I said, go down in the video description, check out that information, those links, the world download, um, do what you like there. Um, join the Discord. The Discord is always listed down there as well. Um, I'm going to look into trying to find someone to help me release schematics as well. And those are probably going to be released in the Discord. Um, I mentioned this a few times, but the reason that I actually include world downloads instead of schematics is so that people who don't use Lightmatica or people who are not comfortable with Lightmatica can get the world download and see it for themselves. They can kind of come through their process and get their own by block by block process out of it. Um, and then people with Lightmatica, you can grab a schematic from that world download. I understand that there are many people who do use Lightmatica who just kind of wish I would just release schematics instead of the world download, but that's why I do the world download. And the reason I don't do both is just time constraints, unfortunately. Um, 
I do have, you know, work in my real life and I love my job. So I dedicate time to that. I love my wife. I dedicate time to her because I enjoy spending time with her as well. And then this kind of takes up the rest of my free time. I don't get much gaming in these days except for this. I'm not complaining. I love doing this. I love everything I'm doing. Um, but if I'm going to start releasing schematics as well uh, on the Discord, probably going to see if I can find someone who's willing to assist with that type of thing, maybe, you know, logging issues and, and being able to triage that. Um, so if you're interested, you can hit me up on discord. As long as you are in a mutual server with me on discord, then you can private message me in my DMS. Um, and I think, is that it? Is that it? We just end the video, right? That's everything on the script. Just kidding. There is always one thing that we're going to be ending with. And that is if you are not okay right now, just know that you are not alone. Keep your chin up. Things will get better. I promise you. But in the meantime, it's okay not to be okay. If everything is going great for you, if your life is okay, if your life is fantastic, I am very happy for you. But always remember, there may be someone in your life who is silently struggling right now and may just need to be allowed to not be okay for a bit. And that is okay. So just remember, it's okay not to be okay. And I will catch you in the next one. Have a good one. Bye.